Welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm Patrick, the co-founder and CEO of Sano Genetics. In this episode, we're going to try something different and cover a handful of interesting news stories and new findings in genetics over the past months. We're just going to spend a couple of minutes hitting the highlights on each of them. So this month in uh, just about 25 or 30 minutes, we're going to cover five different news stories, including 23andMe's plan to collect health record data, research sounding the alarm bells about accuracy of genotyping tests, the largest ever study of genetics and post-traumatic stress disorder, a new huge round of funding for a San Francisco company working on a test to detect cancer from blood before it metastasizes, and then finally a breakthrough cure for a rare disease called amyloidosis that was approved in the UK, and some questions around exactly how much it might cost. So we have a lot to cover today, so we'll get started. I've got Joe Ball in the studio, who is our head of marketing and partnerships, and he's going to read some of the news stories today. Uh, So Joe, why don't you kick us off? So there's a new story from CNBC around 23andMe and how they're starting to pilot the ability for users to add medical data, uh, not just DNA data, which makes them more of a direct competitor with Apple. This story came out on July the 11th, Uh, So it's now a couple months old, but fascinating story nonetheless. So the first sort of talking point from this is really the data that they're going to be using. So they're hoping to incorporate lab results and prescription information and potentially some of your medical history. And I wanted to know, how do you think this helps users and how it helps 23andMe? Yeah, I think that's a a great way to frame it. So for users... The, the goal of 23andMe has always been to empower people with health information. So I, I can definitely see the appeal there for the person who's really interested in understanding more about their health. One of the big criticisms of genetics has always been that um, it's not always powerful in isolation, especially if somebody's already helpful. Genetic data um, can occasionally tell you something really life-changing, but in most cases it doesn't tell you much. So I can understand 23andMe is going to be wanting to move this closer to the healthcare system. So if people can link it to their prescription data, then maybe someday it actually becomes part of the healthcare system itself. Um, but on the other side, you know, you asked the question, what's in it for 23andMe? I think the you know, it's been clear for you know to to most people at least for the last couple of years that 23andMe's primary business model is to sell data to pharmaceutical companies. So. If you talk to anyone at a pharmaceutical company, they'll say genetic data is interesting, but where it's really interesting and powerful to help them develop new drugs or to recruit people for clinical trials, it's when it's combined with prescription information, healthcare data, so you know not only does this person have a genetic risk for Parkinson's, for example, is something that 23andMe works on, obesity as well. But if you can actually link that to health data, then it makes 23andMe's data more valuable so they can uh, sell it to pharmaceutical companies, which is really what drives their business at the end of the day. So it's all about having as much data as possible and relating it to to one another. Yeah, and and the right kind of data. I mean, I think 23andMe has uh, millions of people that have signed up so far. And and what I would guess that they're finding on the research side is that self-reported information asking people, do you have, uh, you know, do you have type 2 diabetes? What medications are you taking? Is only reliable to some extent. So if they can um, get closer to the ground truth, then it allows them to... Um, you know, to to make the data more valuable at the end of the day. And how easy do you think it will be for them to source this data? Because obviously it's it's scattered in, in, in multiple places. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the problem that 23andMe faces is the same one that we as individuals face, which is that our data is siloed off across the healthcare system. So even in a country with a, you know, with a nationalized healthcare system, it can still be scattered across different parts of the medical system. Your records aren't, you know, aren't always digitally readable. So electronic health records in some places have a, a very clear format, but that format can be, you know, very challenging for a computer to analyze. So I think 23andMe faces the same challenges that you as, as an individual would face. Can you get all of this data in the right place without running into data privacy regulations um, and actually being able to make sense of it when it gets somewhere. So uh, I suppose we'll just have to see exactly how it plays out. And looking into the, the field with, with a larger lens, 
Do you think that this could be a new model for D2C genetics companies? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. So there are other, so 23andMe is often criticized because they uh, generally don't require a physician or a doctor to sign off on someone's report. So anyone can, can go and buy a report. 23andMe says that this is empowering to the participant. Uh, many doctors would say that there's potential danger in here if people don't understand the report. So there are other companies like um, Veritas Genetics, for example, does whole genome sequencing and requires a clinician. They, I believe, have a network of their own clinicians, so it's not like your home doctor, but it's more of a uh, effectively an online doctor. And then there are other companies like Invitae or myriad genetics that do specific kinds of genetic conditions that require an even greater level of scrutiny from a from a clinician same with color genomics so they've already um, come at it from another angle to say we want to start from the healthcare system and work our way towards people and so in both of those cases i think there's a there's a way for those companies to get access to your health data if you're a user of those. So whether 23andMe starts to move into the same model of these other companies like Veritas and Color, um, who also use a different kind of sequencing technology or, or whether they um, you know, decide to do something different, I suppose we'll just have to see. So one of the companies mentioned in the article is Apple and how they've been collecting this healthcare data which users are able to store on their iPhone. So what do you think, if there is one at all, would be the reaction from Apple? So I, I wish I knew more about what was going on inside Apple. I mean, I, I think if they, if they developed a genetic test, it would, be a pretty, uh, it would be a pretty big shock to the genetic space. They're known for their design and their quality. So I'd have to think even someone like 23andMe who has... Um, you know, been around for a long time would be concerned about something like this. I, I don't know if they'll do that. I mean, I think at the moment they're probably trying to sell as many iPhones as they can and they see health as a big opportunity. People are interested in it. If they can get this information on their phone, then it's great. Um, and, and Apple has developed a big focus on privacy in the last decade that kind of differentiates it from Facebook or Google or other people. So I see them as a really, as a, as an Apple user, I think of them as a, you know, someone that I would trust with my health data. So they, you know, they have a great, I guess, position of strength from that perspective, whether they think about 23andMe as a, as a competitor or more of a, you know, just another person in their ecosystem in, in terms of the kind of size of the companies, you know, 23andMe isn't a threat to Apple in, in any way, but whether they have genetics plans and, and choose to go into the space, maybe they'll partner with someone, maybe they'll decide to do it themselves. But I think uh, anyone who's working in digital health has got to probably have one eye on Apple and trying to figure out what they're going to do next. And uh, 23andMe have confirmed that the this service that they're piloting will be rolled out gradually. So it won't be available for everyone all at once. Um, and what do you think are going to be the factors that influence the success of this project? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I wish I knew more about exactly how many people they were going to pilot it to and whether it was in a specific, you know, is it going to be a randomly selected group of users? Probably not. I think it will be in a specific disease area or one of their specific communities. But I would guess internally they probably want to figure out a few things. The first is whether users of the platform actually want it and do they get something out of it. The second is going to be how frictionless or how challenging is it to actually make this happen. So if somebody does click that button and say, link my health data, uh, you know, is is that something that they can do with the speed and quality that they expect? And then probably the third point is, as I said earlier, their their main you know they have two customers. It's the person who buys the kit, but it's also the pharmaceutical companies. So GSK is a company that they have a, a big financial relationship right now. So if the people they're working with at GSK are finding the data valuable, then I suspect they'll find a way to expand it throughout the company. Excellent. So moving into our second story, and it's from The Guardian, and it was published on July the 21st. And the this, this title of the story is Senior Doctors Call for Crackdown on Home Genetics Testing Kits. 
And a, a short overview is that there's been an influx of patients who have been wrongly told that they're carrying dangerous mutations linked to cancer or other devastating conditions. Um, an example of this is there have been some women who have incorrectly been informed that they have a faulty BRCA gene, uh, which conveys high risk of breast and ovarian cancer when in fact they don't. So the first talking point from this story would be the increasing burden on GPs, surgeries, and NHS genetics clinics, um, which is a result of these genetic tests and uh, people finding out that they have alarming or confusing results. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Patrick, what do you see in this trend? Yeah, so I ask people about this all the time because I, I think it's... Uh it's an area where we don't have a lot of good data. So there's a, a lot of stories you can, basically any clinical geneticist or GP that you speak to will have at least one story of a patient bringing in some kind of direct to consumer genetic test, whether they, they don't always have anything wrong. They just want help interpreting it or understanding what's going on. So the, one of the challenges with this though is, is we really don't know, is it one in a hundred people who get a test? Is it one in 10? Is it one in a thousand? Um, and what is the impact for, you know, a general practitioner? Are they spending, you know, hours a week or is it, you know, once every couple of months? I think the, the main point is it's not, it's not their job to help people interpret these tests and they're put in a difficult position. If somebody comes in with a report, then if, you know, in the best case scenario, the, the, the report you know doesn't have any alarming information and they're able to say you know there's nothing alarming here there's uh, there's an issue with this though which is genotyping tests that many of the companies like 23andme for example use you you often don't know what you're missing so if the test says you don't have a breast cancer risk factor it's only testing i think in the 23andme's case they only test for three breast cancer risk variants. And they do say on the test that these are the only ones we test for. But if you haven't read that or if you didn't understand it, then you, there might be a false sense of security where somebody takes the test and says, great, I don't, uh, maybe I have a family history of breast cancer, but my test came back looking just fine. So um, it, it's a, it then places a big burden on the GPs. Do they do additional testing? Do they try to interpret the original test? So I think it would be great if we had some kind of uh, study to actually really understand what is the impact on this and also what are the best ways to mitigate against it. Is it, is it regulation that requires a t genetic testing company to have sign off from a doctor, from a genetic counselor? I think that you know, if, if you're giving out health information, I think that's a, you know, potentially a reasonable um, stance for a government to take. Or is it more training for GPs and an understanding that these tests are rising and, and we need a way to, um, to field questions from people who come in with these tests and might not understand exactly what they're saying. And in fact, you uh, mentioned a really good point there when you said not only do the positive results cause these scare issues, but also you can have these false negatives which give people a sense of security. Uh, when in fact they may be at risk, but it, it might just be that the genetic variant wasn't tested for that leads to their risk. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and that's really a difference in the sequencing technology or the, the DNA testing technology. So 23andMe, for example, uses a genotyping array, and it only measures about a half a million to a million positions in your DNA, and, and you have six billion. So there's some things you can do to fill in the blanks, but ultimately you can, you can only really trust what you look for. Other companies, some of the ones I mentioned earlier, like Invitae or Myriad, which are, do a lot of testing in the US, use next generation sequencing, which looks at uh, the DNA in a lot more depth. It's a lot more expensive and they require a doctor to sign it out, but it does mean that if the test says that you have it or if you don't have it then it's much more reliable it's still not foolproof obviously the, those tests miss um miss things that are not included in the area that they've sequenced or occasionally due to errors but it's um it's a different you know it's fundamentally a difference in the kind of technology that's used so it, it may be that the legislation or the regulation needs to be on the technology and the interpretation um, as well as whether you have a doctor or a genetic counselor sign it out 
And so do you see the responsibility of genetics companies growing to uh, encompass this? Or do you see the NHS and, and similar healthcare systems needing to expand their operations so that they're able to support people with these test results? I think the responsibility is, is really on both sides. So the genetic testing companies have a responsibility to communicate accurately what the tests can, can tell people and also... Um, to follow up on any of these serious things and, and you know do the validation that they need to do. So there was some discussion on Twitter last week around uh, some companies, if they see a breast cancer risk variant, before they send it back to the person, they'll do an additional test in the lab to make sure that it's, uh, that it's real. I think that's, uh, it's a, it, you know, that sounds to me like a kind of minimum level of barrier that the company has to cross. But on the NHS side as well, or, or on the side of the government regulators in general, the, the more clarity, the better. It's, uh, I think a, most of these companies have good intentions. So 23andMe talks about empowering consumers, and I think people want access to this data. So to say no one can have access to this data, I think, is also wrong. But it's about striking a balance to say, if people want this data, here's the form they can have it in, and here's your responsibilities as a company to do it right. And, and for me, those responsibilities are you give people transparency around how the data is going to be used. You know, if you're selling to pharmaceutical companies that, you know, to me, that's not a bad thing if the person agrees to it and they, and they know that's how it's being used. But if they don't know, or if they don't understand, then, you know, then, then you shouldn't be doing it that way. And it's also about making sure your reports are reflecting scientific accuracy and are really well done, not just um, you know, something that you think will be interesting or useful from a marketing perspective, but really the, the messaging has got to match up with the, with the underlying science. So Genome Web have published on July the 29th the results of a genome-wide association study on post-traumatic stress disorder. I wanted to get your thoughts on that and uh, just find out a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So the study came out of a a big program in the U.S. called the Million Veteran Program. So um, it's a project that's sequenced, I think, nearly 150,000, more than 150,000 people who are um, veterans, war, war veterans. And um, as you might expect, they have a specific set of uh, conditions that occur much more frequently in war veterans, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, one of the one of the fascinating things that's emerged in genetics over the last five to ten years has been that nearly every psychiatric condition, whether it's schizophrenia or whether it's post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, genetics has a role to play in all of these, and and it's by no means a, a leading role. It's a supporting role alongside trauma and other life events. But actually, how how someone responds to trauma. Uh, and potentially even the treatments of post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar, other sorts of mental health conditions are, are probably affected by our genetics. One of the, I think, amazing things about the study is that it, it's, it's definitely the largest of its kind, so more than 150,000 people, but, but still they only managed to capture, I think, about 6% of the um, variance in the risk of post-traumatic stress disorder that's due to genetics. So, um, so there's still a lot of work to be done. We'll probably need to look at millions of people before we really understand the, the genetic component of these kinds of conditions. But it's exciting nonetheless to see uh, studies of this size looking at something that affects a huge number of people. And so for what reason were they only able to capture around 6%? The, the reason is that uh, the genetics underlying conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder are just very complex. So the, it's the same case in depression, for example. We actually had, so we had Catherine Lewis come on a previous show and she's working in depression. They have more than a million people uh, in some of their studies and they're still not able to capture the majority of the genetic signal. So the phenomenon that they're studying is, is just so complex that actually you need a huge number of people to really understand what's going on. So I think 10 or 15 years ago when these kinds of studies were kicking off, nobody really expected that you would need this many people to understand the genetics of uh, a complex condition. But it's, it's become clear in the last five or 10 years that actually there's, um, we're going to require huge numbers of people to really understand the risk that genetics 
plays and, and also potentially how different people respond to different medications, for example, based on their differences in biology. Fascinating. So the next story is about Freenome, and they've just closed a $160 million Series B financing round. Um, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more information on Freenome, what you think of them, and how you think that investment will work. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an incredible amount of money, um, and it's because they're trying to tackle a really important problem, which is early detection of cancer. So uh, Freenome is based in San Francisco, and they develop what they call a multi-omics test for cancer that I believe is based off analysis of the blood. And they do deep sequencing to try to pick up trace amounts of cancer DNA. So what essentially happens when you have cancer somewhere in the body is that the DNA is shed off of the cancer, ends up in the blood. And if you sequence the blood, you can actually pick up this uh, circulating tumor DNA, they call it. So Freenome doesn't just do the sequencing of blood, but also adds in other kinds of information. So they build a, a multi-omics profile. And the goal is to one day to be able to take anyone's blood, detect that they have cancer DNA floating around, and based on the signature of the DNA, you can actually, in many cases, identify the organ that it came from. So this is very much in the research and development stage, and there are other companies doing the same thing. So Grail has raised, a, I think, even more money than this, several hundred million. They came out of the sequencing company called Illumina, and, uh, and they're working on a similar approach to do sequencing of blood to detect cancer. But if, if any of these companies manage to get the technology to succeed, then it's you know, potentially, um, you know, it's, it's potentially game-changing because we can identify people that have early-stage cancer rather than waiting until it's late-stage because the later it becomes, the more fatal it is, the more difficult it is to treat. So, it's exciting to see that um, clearly they're making some progress and, and there's someone who's willing to um, give them money to try to get this technology to the next stage. And so how far off do we think technology like this is? Oh, it's, it's so hard to say. I think, so I, 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 don't know, I don't know as much about this field. My, my guess would be where it will happen first is in actually profiling later stage cancers. So if you have a stage three or stage four cancer, then being able to monitor the growth of the tumor, whether it's responding to treatments, if you can start at that end where any change that you make could add, you know, could add years to life, then it becomes easier to prove that the model's working and move earlier and earlier. I think one of the challenges with doing it the reverse, where you start with healthy people and try to detect cancer, is that you always have this um, accuracy and false positive and false negative problems. So even if your test is 99% accurate, most people don't have cancer. Uh, so if you're 1% of the time you're getting it wrong, then actually the majority of people you've flagged up don't end up having cancer. So the, the test has to be incredibly accurate for it to work on the scale of a population. Um, and it's, it's the same with DNA testing in general. If most people don't have breast cancer, but you're looking for breast cancer risks, you have to be really accurate in order for it to be useful. So that's why I think it'll probably be, you know, it, certainly already now it's working in people who have a cancer diagnosis and, and you're using this technology to manage it. But hopefully in the future, it'll, it will get good enough that we can start to pick it out earlier and earlier and, and maybe it becomes a, a disease that you don't treat in many cases, but actually you just prevent. I think that would be, that would be an amazing outcome. Excellent. And that brings us on to our final story from the BBC, uh, published July the 9th. And it's about an uh, amazing gene silencing drug, which uh, is going to reach the NHS. Um, I was wondering if you could... So for anyone who doesn't know, would you mind explaining what gene silencing is? Yeah, absolutely. So gene silencing, in a nutshell, is taking a gene that's overactive or doing something it's not supposed to do and using a drug to, to knock that activity down. So I can give an, an example in the case of this article. So the article is about a rare disease called amyloidosis that affects about 150 people in the UK. 
amyloidosis is the result of a gene that the article described as a quote unquote rogue gene, which I think is a great way to put it, that builds up in the body. It creates a sticky protein that's toxic to the body and it accumulates in the liver and the nerves and other organs. So the disease is progressive, meaning once it starts, it gets worse and worse and it, and it can be fatal within uh, the space of a few years. So to break that process down, you have this gene that has a mutation in it um, which causes the gene to be overactive, producing more RNA. So RNA is basically the messenger molecule in between DNA and protein. And then that RNA is turned into this protein which accumulates in the body. So what this gene silencing drug does is target that RNA, so the message in between the DNA and the protein. So by basically finding the RNA and knocking it down, uh, it interrupts the process and, and brings the level of the protein down to normal. So what they found in this, in, in the, with this drug is that basically they could halt or even in some cases reverse the course of the disease from the moment they started giving the drug. So uh, it's, it's really amazing stuff and, and I guess it, it's part of a broader category of drugs that are no longer um, small molecules that are trying to interrupt the protein or treat something way downstream. But we're in medicine in general and in rare disease, we're moving further up. So this targets the RNA. There are lots of fascinating new drugs that are targeting the DNA itself and actually going in and changing whatever mutation was causing the problem in the first place to reverse it. And so how wide an impact could this have? So as a, as a class of therapies, uh, I, th I think it can be incredibly wide. So in, in principle, any condition where the gene the, the disease is caused by the gene being overactive and creating more protein. Um, they may be able to find a way with, you know, with different molecules in each case or, or potentially with some kind of broad um, RNA interference approach to knock down the levels of that RNA and get the DNA back to normal. Um, with gene therapies more generally where you may go in and actually change the mutation itself and restore the gene to its healthy copy. Um, I think one of the challenges is getting the correction to the right place. So if you have a, a disease that's affecting the brain and you need to edit the DNA, then you need to, in theory at least, get the gene therapy to a large fraction of the cells in the brain. Um, in the case of a muscle condition, I think it's a little bit easier because of the way muscle cells are, uh, way muscle cells are structured that you can get the, you can you can get the editing mechanism to a few of the muscle cells and they actually end up in a way sort of sharing them with others so I think there are a few challenges to overcome but but the amount of progress that's been made in the last five years and I think the FDA um, has has estimated that there's going to be 10 to 20 of these new gene therapy based really life-changing therapies every year now um, that I think it's an exciting time to be in rare disease research because some of these drugs are just truly life-changing. And how much is this costing? What's the expense? Yeah, so so this article in the BBC actually uh, said that they didn't know what the cost would be for this particular therapy. And this is a big question because with these gene therapies in general, the, the trend has been that they are transformative and, and can in many cases cure or halt the disease, but the price tag is very high. The reason being the cost of research and development is very high. The number of patients that have the condition, if it's rare, can be pretty low. So for the pharmaceutical company to recoup that R&D cost, it needs to be high. Um, but often healthcare systems are finding or insurance companies are finding it difficult to pay for them. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of, I think, questions to be asked about how, what kind of funding models are different. Is it something that you pay in installments over life or there are different ways to do this? And I, and I think people will be trying different models probably over the next five years. But with this particular treatment in the NHS, they, they haven't actually said yet how much it'll cost. Great. So, so that's all the news for this month. And as always, you can send us any feedback, including questions you have, guests that you want to see on the show, or anything else that's on your mind to podcast at sonogenetics.com. If you like the podcast, we would really appreciate it if you could share it with a friend uh, and or leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And then finally, feel free to visit our website, sonogenetics.com, if you're interested in learning about some of the research projects we're supported right now, as well as reading more on these topics through our blog. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.